Employee engagement is no small feat. It takes care and consideration to measure it and even more so to improvement. But the return on investment on employee engagement initiatives is tremendous. Hey leader, David Burkus here, organizational psychologist and author of four best-selling books on helping leaders and teams do their best work ever. And a big determinant of whether or not teams can do their best work ever is how engaged they are. You know, we've known about the importance of employee engagement for, for decades now, right? Starting with the Gallup organization and their famous Q12 survey of engagement, we've begun to see just how impactful engaged employees are compared to the ones that are mediocre or actively disengaged, for sure. We know that teams that have actively engaged employees have a 59% lower turnover rate. We know that highly engaged teams are 17% more productive. We know that businesses with highly engaged employees have a 6% greater profit margin, but getting employees to feel engaged and even knowing if they do feel engaged is, is no small feat. It takes a level of, of care and consideration, of thoughtful approach. It's not enough to just email blast them with a random survey you pulled off the internet, even though here you are on the internet looking for that information. But luckily in this episode, we're gonna talk about the various different ways you can measure engagement. And then once you do measure it, what you can do to improve it, no matter what those results are. The first method to measuring employee engagement and probably the one used most often, the one you were thinking of, even as you were looking for this information is surveys. Now, why is this the most common? Well. In some ways, it's the easiest, right? depending on the size of the organization. A large organization, this is definitely the easiest, but it's also been the most popular because there's a ton of different businesses that are designed entirely around measuring employee engagement for your business. You know, This started, as I said, decades ago with the Gallup organization. They launched what they called the Q12, 12 questions that could hint at employee engagement. And while the Q12 is the most widespread survey of employee engagement, dozens and dozens of competitor organizations have popped up with what they believe are better measurements, better scales, better questions, better surveys to measure engagement. We even have surveys now that mix multiple choice questions with open-ended questions that get tabulated and calculated qualitatively. We've mixed methods from the annual employee survey that was probably most common to pulse surveys that are quick questions delivered much more frequently to measure changes. And surveys have their strengths and weaknesses. I mean, the biggest strength, as I said earlier, is it's easy. If you have 10,000 employees, doing the other tactics that we're gonna talk about in this episode are a lot more complicated. So a survey is, is easy. A survey is often usually objective, right? If you're sticking with something like the Q12, where there's 12 simple questions that you answer on a scale from you know, strongly agree to strongly disagree, it's hard to argue with that data. So it's objective. And that matters, especially as people and personalities and senior leaders change, having the objective data that hasn't changed over time is, is going to be a benefit. But there are cons to surveys as well. The first is it's a bit of the problem of measurement to begin with, right? Just starting the process of measuring something Something with something like a survey can skew the results. And we know this is the Hawthorne effect. Elton Mayo's famous study of just tweaking certain workers led to increases in productivity no matter which tweak you did because they felt attended to. The opposite of the Hawthorne effect can also happen as well. The more you're giving people these surveys, especially if you're not sharing the results of them, especially if they don't feel like anything's changed, the more these surveys can actually be a reminder of how disengaged they actually are. So while surveys are easy and surveys are objective, they may not be your best option because the human biases of the people taking those surveys can skew the results as well. Fortunately, there's a few other methods. The second method for measuring employee engagement is proxies. And what I mean by proxies here are other objective measurements that we know correlate to employee engagement. Sometimes they're leading indicators of engagement, meaning that they would predict engagement. And a lot of times they're lagging indicators of engagement, meaning that we see these uh, as the result of a lack of employee engagement. So there are positive proxies, things like productivity. If you've got a consistent way to measure productivity on your team or among individuals, if you've got a consistent and objective way, you can see that as a rough correlation to how engaged they are. We know that engaged employees are more productive. And so as we're looking at the employees that are more productive, we can make assumptions about the likelihood of them also being engaged. If you're gonna use a proxy like this though, it's less and less about the individual employee. There are some incredibly talented, 
but incredibly disengaged people out there. It's more about changes over time. If productivity is declining, if it suddenly and markedly declined, and, and we find out that it wasn't for any external factor in the competitive environment, that could be a sign that something happened you know, a few clicks back that decreased employee engagement dramatically and the drop in productivity was a result. So we look at productivity changes over time to learn a whole lot more about engagement than just assuming that if we stack ranked all our employees, the most productive are the most engaged. Another proxy we can use, and this is sort of an inverse correlation proxy, is things like absenteeism. How often are people calling in sick or just ghosting and disappearing for work? How often are they failing to show up on Zoom meetings or in-person meetings, right? How often are they just checked out. We know from research that increases in employee engagement lead to decreases in absenteeism. And so if we're seeing increased absenteeism, we can assume that means decreased employee engagement over time. Now, a side note here, I realize that we are publishing this episode after two years of dealing with a global pandemic. So your absentee numbers might be a bit skewed. And so watching that over time may be difficult. But as the world comes out of that, and as we begin to settle into a new normal, especially as we begin to develop what we think are the new ways of working on our team and on our organization, paying attention to absenteeism and the changes that could happen as we make different tweaks to working schedules and working arrangements could be a huge, huge thing to study, not only for engagement, but for whether or not our plan is working. Similar to absenteeism, turnover is a negative but lagging indicator of employee engagement. We know that engaged employees have longer tenures. And so when there is disengagement, we're going to see increases in turnover. Engaged employees are just less likely to go look for other jobs as well. So not only is there turnover, but you know, if the, if the percentage of time that we have to make counter offers to people who tell you that they're entertaining moving is increasing or decreasing, that is a lagging indicator of where our employee engagement is as well. The benefit that all of these proxy measures have, one of the strengths of them is that they don't suffer from that same Hawthorne effect bias that can come in by measurement. We're measuring productivity and absenteeism and turnover anyway, or at least we should be. And so making those assumptions around the correlation to that and employee engagement is a way of studying on a broad scale relative correlations between all of those things without directly asking people and risking skewing our results just by measuring it. The cons of these proxies is obvious. These correlations are not one-to-one. -one. These correlations are not perfect, right? So at best, we might have a 50% correlation, but it's still helpful for looking at trends over time. And that's why we said, even in the productivity proxy, that's why we said, don't look at this as a measure of one-to-one -one engagement. But changes over time signal that changes in employee engagement have been happening over time. The third method for measuring employee engagement, and actually this is my favorite one for if you are leading a team and not running an entire organization, are interviews. I'm a huge fan of what's becoming known in the lingo as the stay interview. You know, we do exit interviews. Somebody quits and somebody else from HR calls them and asks them a series of different questions. And you know, like we assume that these questions are going to give us answers that help us improve as an organization. But if you've been on the receiving end of an exit interview, what was your number one goal? Uh, your number one goal was to get them off the phone and move on with your life. You already decided to quit. Or maybe you use that exit interview to just vent and so your feedback has a little bit of bias. Stay interviews are different. Stay interviews are like exit interviews for people who are there, who are in the organization and who are committed. And they help you learn things about what could be improved in the organization by people who are still committed to staying in the organization. So you get the benefit of that exit interview feedback, but you actually have the ability to improve the situation of those very people. You get to know what will help them them stay. Now, the reason this is a great way to measure employee engagement is that you're doing these stay interviews ideally on a regular basis, like let's say every six months or every nine months. And so as you're thinking about your team and as you're talking to them and getting information from all those various interviews, you can make comparisons over time. You can look for trends and things you need to do to improve as a leader and improve the engagement on your team. And you can get feedback that's much more valuable than, oh, 40% of your employees are actively engaged. So there's a lot of strengths to that idea of the stay interview as well. Now the downside is you can't necessarily do it as often, right? People don't want to be conducting these stay interviews all of the time. What you can do to counteract that is as you're doing your regular check-ins every week, every month, et cetera, you could seed a couple more stay interview related questions about, hey, what do you admire most about this company? Or what really frustrates you about this organization? Or what obstacles are in the way from helping you do your best work? You can seed those questions into your check-in and have the benefits of both. The stay, the big formalized stay interview, but a much more frequent collection of responses and of data to get a proxy for how engaged your team is and how you need to improve as a leader. 
Now, all three of these methods, surveys, proxies, or interviews, all three of them are a way to get a measurement. And as I said before, we're looking for changes over time because that's much more valuable. But even more than looking for changes over time, we're looking to make change over time and improve employee engagement. So it's not enough to just measure. We have to do a couple other steps as well. I mean, the first step we have to do is we have to share the results. I still don't understand why so many organizations make their employees suffer through so many different types of feedback surveys and pulse surveys and things like that and then never share out the results. They took the survey. They remember taking the survey. They want to know what you're going to do about the responses to those surveys. So you're gonna to need to share the results. In order to share those results though, you obviously need to analyze where we are right now and what that means. And you also need to make a goal and make a plan for how you're gonna achieve that goal as well. There is no value to measuring employee engagement just to measure employee engagement. The purpose of it is to improve it. And the best way to do that is to have a plan. And the best, best way to do that is to share that plan out with people so they know what to expect, so they can hold you accountable to the interventions that you said you were going to do, and so that they can feel that their feedback matters. Just taking the survey and sharing the results might actually move the needle on employee engagement a little bit. If you do the best, best way to measure and make a plan with employee engagement, you're going to find that the people on your team and the people in the whole organization are much more likely to do their best work ever. Oh, and one more thing. One of the biggest things that moves the needle on improving employee engagement is how appreciated employees feel for their work. So in order to get better at that, you're gonna to wanna to check out this video here on how to help make employees feel appreciated. I think you're really going to appreciate watching this video right here, that one.